Mask Reform, welcome this back to Woodsboro High School. It doesn't look exactly the same, but this could technically be a different entrance, and this could just be a different part of the building. But one aspect that is definitely a new addition, which you might have missed, is this bus, dedicated to the late principal Arthur Hembry, who was one of the victims in Scream 1. Here's a little bit of a better look from a behind the scenes photo. For other references that you might not have noticed, like the movie props featured in the background of Stabathon, stick around to the end of this video. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Welcome to Things You Missed. I am Don't Look At My Tits, I Have A Mind Morris, and if you remember that reference, it probably hasn't been long since you last watched Screeform. And I actually think this is one of the most warranted examples of putting a number in the title in place of a letter. In a movie like S7N or Thir 13 Ghosts, there's no real reason for it other than style. But since this movie serves as a satire of horror movie remakes, most of which have the same title as the original, inserting the number 4 allows you to read it as just Scream, while it's still differentiating that this is the fourth movie. Which makes it all the more disappointing that they didn't follow suit with Scream 2022 by calling it Five Cream. Let's get in to the things you missed. Being a remake, this one opens exactly the same way that the original did, with a teen girl receiving a phone call. Sherry and Trudy are trying to pick a movie, and we see the blue screen on the TV, something that I talked about when I covered the original Scream, which represents the idea that a movie is about to begin. Not only for us, the audience, but also the characters, who are somewhat aware that they're living through a movie. However, this is the first movie to take place well after the others. It's set in 2010, so the new horror reference points for the young characters are Naughty's horror, like Saw and Final Destination. Saw in particular seems to have the biggest influence on Scream 4. It's the movie that Sherry chooses for the movie night, and the color grade takes after the Saw look. For example, look at the first outdoor scene, and how the bloom resembles the look of the public execution trap from Saw 7. Or, for a better idea of exactly how the look of this movie differs from the previous ones, try comparing the stab footage from Scream 2 to that of the fourth movie. There are also a few scenes that seem to have Saw's imprint on them. Olivia encounters her masked attacker hiding in her closet, just like Adam from Saw. Rebecca is ambushed in an empty parking garage, just like Dr. Gordon from Saw. One of the side characters is Robbie Mercer, who's played by Eric Knudsen. He was Daniel Matthews in Saw 2, and both of them know a lot about cameras. Stab is now a seven movie series, just like how Saw was at the time. Stabathon is held in an abandoned barn. This was well before Jigsaw, the Saw movie that's set in an abandoned barn, but Gail's coming across this creepy pig head next to these rusty gears looks like something right out of the original Saw saga. Or as some of you suggested on my Saw videos, the saga. The opening of Screeform also serves as a mission statement about what we should expect for this movie, and that is to expect the unexpected. The unexpected is the new cliché. Modern audiences get savvy to the rules of the originals. So the reversals become the new standard. The intro does this with its false openings. First we see two girls get killed, turns out that just stabs six. Then we see some meta-cinema commentary from our new characters. It's all so predictable, there's no element of surprise. You can see everything coming. But that just turns out to be Stab 7. So we're seeing firsthand how the filmmakers are now actively trying to do what the audience doesn't expect in the decade since Stab 3. And this, of course, also applies to our movie, Scream 4. Screeform. So after those two false intros, we meet our real intro characters, Marnie Cooper and Jenny Randall. Marnie does share a last name with C.C. Cooper from Scream 2, but they probably aren't related, despite their shared eye and hair color. I'm actually more interested in her first name, Marnie, because it brings to mind the 1964 Alfred Hitchcock film. Being one of the most important figures in the horror genre, Hitchcock has already been the subject of several homages in the Scream franchise, like Billy Loomis sharing a name with Sam Loomis from Psycho, the shower shot from Psycho being in Stab, and one of the actresses in Scream 3 incorrectly identified identifying it as a reference to Vertigo, among others. In the classroom where Cinema Club is held, you can spot a Vertigo poster. On the chalkboard, there's a lesson about the prot structure of Hitchcock's rear window, and Kirby's room has a rear window poster as well. Marnie may not be the only Hitchcock namesake. Sidney has a publicist named Rebecca, which could be an homage to Hitchcock's 1940 film Rebecca. And the police officer Perkins is actually named Anthony Perkins. We hear his partner call him that. Anthony. Anthony Perkins is the actor who played Norman Bates in Psycho. The rest of the intro sequence features a lot of fun homages to the Scream franchise, like Ghostface trying to tell Jenny to think of him as her director. You're in my movie, you got a fun part, so don't blow it. The last villain literally was the director of Stab 3. Marnie is sent crashing through the glass door, a la Steve Orth from Scream. But you, you're the dumb blonde with the big tits. We'll have some fun with you before you die. And just like Sydney predicted in the first scream, she makes the mistake of running up the stairs rather than out the front door. She ends up going up to the attic, like Sydney did to escape a ghost face at Stu's house, and then eventually to the garage, where her escape is foiled by the garage door, just like Tatum in Scream. Dewey is woken up by his ringtone. <laughs> Thank you. 
The song is Axel F from the soundtrack of Beverly Hills Cop, and Dewey is also a cop again. He's now the sheriff of Woodsboro. Also of note, this song has been remade many times by the likes of Techno Cop, Clock, and yes, Crazy Frog. Soon we meet the next generation of Woodsboro High School students. It seems that Kirby knows who the killer is without actually knowing who the killer is. Before you get in the car, you have to promise not to kill me. There's a similar foreshadowing moment like this later, when Officer Haas is doing a crossword puzzle and asks Perkins for a four-letter word for courage. Uh, guts. It would not be long after that when Olivia's guts would be ripped out by Ghostface. This event is also foreshadowed by the Chinese takeout boxes that have a red splatter design. But before we get there, we would check in on the current state of Gail Riley, whose office plays host to a few more Things You Missed. As the new sheriff of the town, Deputy Dewey Riley oversees everything that happens in Woodsboro. But can he see why kids love NordVPN? <laughs> the speeds are blazing fast. Want to see me connect to NordVPN? Want to see me do it again? It's easy to use. Connect with one click or just set up auto connect so you're always protected. With NordVPN, third parties will not be able to spy on your online activity. Even your internet service provider and your government will have no idea if you illegally streamed that new movie or not. Because it's none of their business. You want more content? Let's talk about content. Nord's got over 5,400 servers in 60 countries, meaning that you can change your virtual location and access way more movies and shows. For example, Scream 4 isn't available on Netflix in my country. But if I just click on this United Kingdom, server, the Brits got the hookup! At just over $3 per month, I don't know why you wouldn't get Nord. For the cost of a beverage, you too can have that peace of mind when browsing the web by clicking the link in the description at nordvpn.com slash cz'sworldvpn. But wait! When you use my link, you also get one month free and a 30-day money-back guarantee. So you have no reason not to go try it. Click the link in the description to get started. Each new character in the fourth installment of Scream is a spiritual successor to one of the characters from the original Scream, which is why it's a satire of horror movie remakes. Like a remake, you have new actors playing old roles. Jill is the new Sydney Prescott, a high school student thrust into danger due to the attack of her family member. Trevor is Billy Loomis, the boyfriend who becomes a major suspect. Kirby is Randy Meeks, the biggest horror film buff of the friend group and walking knowledge database. Olivia is Tatum Riley, the attractive and popular girl who dies way too early. Charlie is Stu Mocker, the easily peer pressured friend. Robbie Mercer is Kenny, the camera guy. And Rebecca is Gail Weathers, the media. She even makes the comparison between Dewey and Barney Fife, just like Gail did back in Scream 2. Page 32. Deputy Dewey filled the room with his Barney Fife-ish presence. Thanks, you. Just wait, Barney Fife. I'm running an event here. Speaking of Gail, she's now writing a work of fiction after penning the book trilogy that became the basis for the Stab movies, and we can see them right here. The Woodsboro Murders, College Terror, and Hollywood Horror. It seems that she also wrote other stories about a Ghostface killer because there's this additional book, Ghostface Returns, which we get a better look at later in Jill's room. This is probably the basis for the fictional Stab movies 4 through 7. After news that the killings have started again breaks, we see the Woodsboro Police Station, and if you pause, you can see the KQIS 6 van whirring by in the foreground. This is the same station that Gail worked for back in Scream 1, where the van was parked outside during Stu Mocker's party. We also see the Channel 6 microphone appear a couple of times throughout the movie. Rebecca is celebrating the news of the two girls being butchered, and she calls it a payday. The media sensationalizing the crimes has been a theme that has run through each of the Scream movies so far. In the first and second films, it's the TV news media, in the third, it's the Hollywood film industry, and now we're seeing it happen in publishing. There would also be another angle present to this in Scream 4, social media. Robbie gets involved as essentially what we would now call the IRL streamer, and the killers are recording all of their kills, which Jill plans to use to help frame Trevor and Charlie, and anticipates that the footage will go viral and garner her more attention. However, she fails, so this part never pans out. Later in the movie, Rebecca tries to convince Sydney to sign a new book deal. You're a victim for life, so embrace it. And this is another aspect of the social commentary about the media. Rebecca doesn't understand the point of Sydney's book. It's about her journey to no longer be the victim. Jill, on the other hand, is on a journey to become the victim. How do you think people become famous anymore? You don't have to achieve anything. You just gotta have fucked up shit happen to you. She's an extreme example of someone with what we would now call a victim mentality. Like the original Scream's social commentary about sensationalizing violence in the news and Scream 3's commentary about inappropriate relations in Hollywood, Screeform's take on victim mentality has only become more relevant over the years as more and more people try to invent a scenario where they're perceived as having been wronged, with the intention of going viral. The my experience with blank trope on social media has become as cliche as the slasher movies that Randy idolized in Scream. He had me unfollow all of them. 
which to me uh, was really weird and I didn't like it. But anyway, when Rebecca meets Gail, Gail tells her that she is Gail Riley now. She's been married to Dewey for 10 years, to which Rebecca is surprised. It always seemed like more of a movie romance than a real one because it was a movie and in real life you two never be. In my Scream 3 video, I mentioned that Dewey and Gail's marriage was one of the many plot elements inspired by real life, because David Arquette and Courtney Cox actually got married. Now, they had actually been married for 10 years, and like in the movie, their relationship was in trouble. They separated in real life in 2010, the same year that this movie is set. The trouble in their on-screen marriage is exemplified that evening at the house in a line that also serves as another callback to that Dewey and Gail scene from Scream 2. This time, instead of Dewey quoting a specific page from Gail's book, he's quoting Sidney's book in regards to his marriage. Just when you think things can't get any worse, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they get better. Mm. Out of Darkness by Sydney Prescott, page 220. Later in the evening, after Ghostface comes for Olivia, Sydney tries to get into the Morris household to save her, and she does so by throwing a potted plant through the window. Sydney has always been seen as the slasher successor to Laurie Strode from Halloween, with her story even running parallel to Laurie's in Scream 1, and now we've got her throwing a potted plant at a house, like Laurie in Halloween. As always, the movie is packed with Halloween references. When Sydney makes a guest appearance at the cinema club, Robbie hypes up her presence by comparing her to the actresses that starred in Halloween and The Exorcist. Beyond Jamie Lee Curtis, forget Linda Blair, I mean, this is the ultimate. Which is also kind of its own joke, because they both appear in Scream 1. The cinema club holds their party, Stabathon, at an abandoned farmhouse, much like the party in Halloween 5. But if you look closer, there's a for sale sign outside the farm that says Roberts Realty. Roberts refers to Sydney's mom's side of the family. Her mother was Maureen Roberts before getting married, and Sydney's aunt is Kate Roberts. She is the realtor that this sign is referring to. Earlier drafts of the script make mention of her profession. Kate takes Sydney in while she's back in Woods. We can assume that Sydney's dad moved away or died because he's not in the movie. So Sydney is staying with a realtor who happens to be selling the location of Stabathon. And this is another similarity she has to Laurie Strode, who after losing her parents is taken in by the Strode family, and her new adopted father is a realtor who is selling a house, the Myers house, which was the location of a more literal Stabathon. With Sydney being part of the older generation now, she takes responsibility for the kid's safety. Towards the end, she instructs Jill to hide under a bed and then makes it look as if she's helped her escape off the balcony. This is very similar to Laurie's strategy in Halloween. Of course, there's one line where Sid is made out to look less like Lori and more like her brother. You just won't die, will you? Who are you? Michael Myers. The last Halloween reference I want to bring up is this poster seen in the classroom where Cinema Club is held. If you've seen Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, you know that it is not a remake of Halloween 2. Rob Zombie's Halloween 1 is a remake of the original Halloween, however, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 goes off in its own strange direction. I'm guessing this was likely a hint about what the plans were for the Scream franchise. In January 2010, screenwriter Kevin Williamson, who had returned after an absence in Scream 3, stated that he was contracted to make Scream 4 and Scream 5. However, the fourth movie underperformed at the box office, director Wes Craven got brain cancer, and the fifth installment had to be put on the shelf. Save that one for a rainy decade. But as long as we're talking about the meta of Scream form, I've got to mention what is perhaps the most meta thing in the whole franchise. Remember that cop character, Anthony Perkins? Well, not only is he named after a psycho actor, but he also appeared in Scary Movie 3. Scary Movie is a parody of Scream, and Scream is a satire of the horror genre. If you've kept up with my Scream Things You Missed series, you already know that the first Scream contained many references to slasher movies, including Wes Craven's own work. So Scream 4 focuses on movies that were remade. The new version of the video store scene is the cinema club scene, where we see a whole bunch of movie posters, like this one, The Hills Have Eyes. This checks both boxes. It was directed by Wes Craven, and it received a remake in 2006. If you're really paying attention, you'll also notice the poster for The People Under the Stairs, a 1991 Wes Craven production. Before his death, Craven planned to remake this, but never quite got around to it. There's also a poster for George Romero's Dawn of the Dead. It was remade in 2004. The Thing is a remake of The Thing from Another World from 1951. You may notice the poster on the left is not a horror movie. It's a film called Zack and Miri Make a Porno. This is actually a continuation of a series of Easter eggs between Wes Craven and Kevin Smith. I talked about this in greater detail in my Scream 3 episode but the two directors have been exchanging cameos and easter eggs in their movies since the original screen. If you look around the classroom, you'll also see that the Cinema Club are big fans of the Stab franchise. You can see the Stab poster right here, and the Stab 3 poster in the back corner. An interesting note here is the tagline for Stab 3 is Hollywood Horror, which means this is not the same movie we saw being shot in Scream 3, whose tagline was Return to Woodsboro. It seems that since all of the cast was killed, the studio decided to make Stab 3 about that, rather than trying to recast for Return to Woodsboro. Little did they know, the story would 
return to Woodsboro all on its own. Behind the shelf is the Stab 5 poster and the Stab 6 poster, but that's really only just the beginning of the display of their Stab fandom. We see much more that night at the Stabathon, where there are a lot of background details that you may have missed. Here's a girl dressed as Casey Becker, posing with a decoration of the gutted Casey Becker, which you can see more of behind the crowd right here. Another display shows Tatum Riley hanging out of the garage flap. Many of the attendees are wearing costumes of Scream and Stab characters, something that is very accurate if you've ever been to a screening. These two guys in the audience are both dressed as Dewey, and one of them even has a mustache hat. There's another Casey Becker on the left. A lot of the kids have Woodsboro High School Letterman jackets, like Casey's boyfriend, Steve Orth, but then again, those are their actual high school jackets, so I won't count that one. But I will count this couple dressed as Gail and Dewey. Gail in her green news dress, and Dewey in his uniform. This party is all about the Stab movies, come on! How meta can you get? How what can you get? I don't know, I heard him say it. Gail places cameras around the party, much like she did in Scream, so that she can watch from her vehicle. In fact, one of the cameras is right beneath the movie screen, just as the surveillance camera in Scream was placed under Stu's television. Now you're probably wondering, are there differences between the version of Stab that we saw in Scream 2 and what we see here in Scream 4? So I cut both films apart and lined them both up, and the answer is yes, there are a lot of differences. Enough to make a whole video about it, which I plan on doing. But for this video, I'm only going to talk about the ones that are interesting. In Scream 4, we see this card at the beginning, a Robert Rodriguez film. This sort of qualifies as a crew reference easter egg because Robert Rodriguez was brought in to direct the stab footage for Scream 2. After lining up all of the cut points, there's an interesting synchronization that occurs, which is that Gale gets stabbed at the same time as Casey in Stab, which in Scream 2 occurs at the same time Maureen was stabbed inside of the movie theater. Just thought that was kind of cool. Before being attacked, Gale holds her camera by her waist, looking behind her, unintentionally recreating the moment from Scream where the characters in the news van see Ghostface sneaking up behind Randy. Behind you, kid! This time, it's Dewey, concerned about Gale. Gale! Gale behind you! This is more than just a nostalgic callback, though. It also sets up a scene later, where Robbie puts on his headset backwards. We're expecting Ghostface to appear behind him, so it's more of a surprise when the killer ends up being right in front of him. Just another example of this movie's mission to do the unexpected. That also includes the film's ending. We're led to believe that it'll end at the party, just like the original, but... This is what the reboots do. They they, they one-up the original ending. The Woodsboro murders ended at a party. So in the remake, the party's the false ending, new rules. However, this also ends up being a false ending. The true ending takes place at the hospital. Just as there were two false openings, there were also two false endings. This is something that happens in the Halloween remake. The original ends at the Doyle house, but the remake continues on and ends at the Myers house. There are probably other examples of remakes in the 2000s doing this, though. So in this case, we have the quote-unquote remake continuing on past the original. Whereas in the 90s, if you wanted to continue on past the original, you had to watch Scream 2, which contains a scene of a character named Cece watching the movie Nosferatu and getting killed shortly after. For this reason, I find it fitting that Kirby's room displays a Nosferatu poster, but who knows if there is any actual meaning behind this choice. I mean, it's kind of a stretch on my part to make that connection. However, I am convinced that the wardrobe choices were definitely done for a reason. I talked about how each character in Scree form represents one of the characters from Scream. However, after the reveal of the killers, all of those roles are reassigned. Jill is now Billy, the mastermind behind the murders. Charlie is still Stu, the accomplice hoping to vent his romantic frustrations with a knife, and Trevor is now Neil Prescott, the tied-up victim who is going to be framed. So it's no mistake that Jill is wearing a blue plaid shirt, just like what Billy wore at the party, and Trevor is wearing this exact outfit that Neil was captured in back in 1996. Other callbacks include Sydney escaping off the roof, Charlie being tied to a chair like Steve Orth, Kirby being quizzed on horror movies like Casey Becker, and of course, this iconic line. Hello, Sydney. Surprise. Surprise, Sydney. Surprise, Sydney. I imagine she's getting tired of hearing that. In my personal opinion, Screeform was one of the more satisfying surprises though, which makes all of the clues about the killer's identities all the more impressive. Upon rewatching the movie, I noticed that while Jill and Charlie pretend that they aren't particularly close, they do sit next to each other in class, and Jill is the only one to not take out her phone when everyone's getting alerts about Jenny and Marnie, though I'm not sure why she doesn't just at least pretend to be interested. On a somewhat related note, fellow Zach and fellow horror creator Zach Cherry pointed out in his video that Sydney doesn't appear to have a cell phone in the movie. She receives calls on Jill's cell phone and the Roberts landline, and after arriving at Kirby's, she borrows Jill's phone to place an outgoing call to Dewey to plea for help. This is probably because Sydney 
Tony is tired of all the prank calls and doesn't want to give any future copycat killers a means of contacting her. It's a nice touch. Mr. Cherry also attributes a lot of the kills to Charlie, which many were surprised by, but I personally think it kind of makes sense. Jill would have wanted to set it up that way because of the fact that they're recording all of the kills and the fact that she's secretly planning to frame Charlie as one of the killers alongside Trevor. It stands to reason that the police would probably study these videos and take note of the killer's height and broad shoulders. Charlie might also be the most forceful ghost face we've seen. Check this out. <laughs> When I analyzed Scream 1, I mentioned that the poster in Stu's room matched a poster displayed in the video store, and that this linked his character to the movie-obsessed killer. A similar tactic is used here. Jill's room is filled with clues. This Farewell Republic poster and this, uh, I don't know, Reverse Griffin are both posters seen hanging at the cinema club. I will mention the possibility that there's actually no meaning behind that. They could have just reused the posters and hoped that nobody would notice. Because this War of the Worlds poster in Jill's room also shows up in her English class, I can't think of any reason they'd want to link Jill to her English classroom. So it's very possible that the art department just ran out of posters and I'm just looking for things that aren't there. But at the very least, we can conclude that Jill is more interested in horror movies and serial killers than she likes to let on. From her American Werewolf in London poster, to her Edgar Allan Poe stir, to her Gail Weathers books, books on psychology and serial killers, and even her Fallout Boy poster. This particular one is the cover for their single, I Don't Care, whose chorus matches her MO for the movie. I don't care what you think, as long as it's about me. This might be more happenstance, but this is also off their album Folie à Deux, which is French for madness in pairs, a term that could probably be used to describe each pair of the ghost face killers. I love this album and I'd love to talk more about it, but this is not a music analysis channel, so let's get back to scree form. After Olivia is killed, Charlie comes out of the dark to attack Sydney and Jill, and Jill receives a cut on her forearm, the same spot that Derek got cut in Scream 2. No struggle, he just cut you and ran away? You're lucky he didn't kill you. Yeah, it's awfully convenient. You say what? Nothing. It's just a shame he got away so easily. It's just a shame you got there too late. Of course, Derek ended up not being guilty, so Dewey would probably want to avoid making any similar accusations about Jill. When Sydney speaks to Jill the following night, she has what she thinks is a bonding moment with her cousin. You know when people say, I know how you feel, but you know they're just saying that because they really have no freaking idea how you feel. I know how you feel. I love that line because in reality, Sydney has no idea how Jill feels because she doesn't suspect her of being the killer. It's like the sticker on the door of the cinema club says, not your usual suspects. Jill claims she can never handle the attention of being the surviving victim, when in fact, that's exactly what she wants, even if her 15 minutes of fame really is only 15 minutes. And finally, at Kirby's after party, Trevor shows up unexpectedly and just walks right in because the door is unlocked. By the way, Kirby, with everything that's going on right now, you probably shouldn't leave that unlocked. Sorry. Charlie is not worried about locking the door because he knows there's no threat. He and Jill are both in the room already. Screeform would be the final legacy of director Wes Craven, but his creation would live on without him after yet another 11 year gap with Scream 2022. I'll be covering it next time on Things You Missed, so make sure to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I'll see you then, assuming we both survive.